The Sacramento Kings were once the best team in the NBA. Executive Jeff Petrie renovated the lowly franchise in the late 90s. Petrie hired Rick Adelman, an experienced coach. He made a controversial trade for Chris Webber, a multi-talented young power forward mired in serious legal troubles off the court. Webber's play blossomed in Adelman's fast-paced offense, so much that he overcame his initial distaste for Sacramento and signed a huge long-term extension. By 2002, a team fronted by Webber and Adelman had graduated from good to great to championship caliber. Center Vlade Divac complimented Webber down low with his own veteran savvy and creative flair. Young Peja Stojakovic broke out as not just an elite shooter, but an all-star, one of the league's best scorers. Doug Christie was the prototypical glue guy, equipped to guard the best opposing scorer and contribute some shooting of his own. Bobby Jackson was Sacramento's beloved spark plug off the bench, joined by rapidly improving youngster Hato Turkoglu. And a risky 2001 trade paid off. Petrie swapped dazzling fan favorite Jason Williams for Mike Bibby, who soon proved himself to be a superior, more reliable point guard, precisely what the Kings needed to win it all. And the quest for Sacramento's first ring was going well. The Kings held home court advantage in the 0-2 Western Conference Finals and took a 2-1 series lead over the LA Lakers. 2002 looked like the year the Kings would become finalists, if not champions, and maybe not for the last time. This one hurts. So let's hop right into the 0-2 Western Conference Finals. Yes, Shaq and Kobe and friends were twice defending champs seeking a three-peat, but Phil Jackson's team was not favored. The Kings held home court advantage in the series and after squandering it early, regained their edge with a big game three victory on the road. This despite playing the start of the series without Peja Stojakovic, who'd injured his ankle earlier in the playoffs. On May 26, 2002, Sacramento stood on the verge of winning again in LA to set up a 3-1 series lead they weren't likely to surrender. Keto Turkoglu stepped up in Page's absence, part of a rock-solid starting unit that led by double digits before LA shooter Robert Ori chipped away at the deficit. Vlade Divac led Sacramento's balanced scoring but missed this first of two late free throws to give LA some life. The Lakers got the ball back down just two with 11 seconds left, but Kobe missed, Shaq missed, Sacramento's top-notch defense got the job done, except for this. Divac tipped one last rebound out of the paint and straight into the deadly hands of Big Shot Rob. The Lakers have won! Robert Ory's greatest hits tour continues! A 3-1 series lead became a 2-2 tie because of this ill-fated slap. Painful, but not the end of the world. Sacramento returned home and pulled back ahead on Mike Bibby's game-winning jumper. And you might remember what happened next. Game 6 is still one of the most controversial games in NBA history. The extreme discrepancy in foul calls drew attention during the action. It made headlines immediately afterward and then again years later when crooked former ref Tim Donaghy came right out and said officials rigged Game 6 in the Lakers' favor. We've got to keep it moving, but that rabbit hole awaits if you really want to lose your mind. That said, rigged or not, the Kings had a chance to win game six. Bibby could have tied it up with this three in the final seconds. Same for game seven. Despite dismal free throw shooting, the Kings pushed the decisive contest to overtime only to screw up the final minute. The Lakers won the West, then marched ahead to their third straight championship. That sucks but the Kings had more than demonstrated they were on par with the dynastic Lakers. Especially given the turmoil brewing in LA, the future looked bright. And indeed, the 0203 Kings were just as good as the year before, if not better. The team looked the same, only deeper. Progress from Turkoglu and high-flying Gerald Wallace, plus a couple new signings. Even with Weber, Stojakovic, Bibby, and Bobby Jackson all missing significant time due to injury, the Kings nearly matched their 0-2 peak. They won 59 games and got healthy in time for the postseason, where they unceremoniously extinguished the Stockton Malone title quest. Next up were the Dallas Mavericks, an excellent team, but one the Kings had handled in the regular season. Sacramento immediately made a statement by dominating Game 1 in Dallas. 
Game two brought disaster. In the third quarter of a blowout loss, Weber planted his feet to catch a lob from Bibby and never made it off the floor. After years of wear, the meniscus in Weber's left knee tore. The Kings competed impressively without their top scorer, but fell to Dallas in Game 7. One year after cruel twists of fate and dubious officiating pushed the Kings off the precipice of victory, an injury stopped their second ascent well short. And this one hurt long term. Weber's injury required summertime surgery, and the Kings would miss their star for a while. Petrie knew Sacramento needed help down low. He acquired Brad Miller in a deal that lost the Kings Turkaloo and key bench defender Scott Pollard. That and a couple other little moves left Coach Adelman with less depth, much less defense, and of course no Weber entering 0304. But the Kings still had Peja, who earned a few MVP votes with a brilliant season of scoring. The Kings didn't reintroduce Weber, who served a suspension on top of his recovery, until March. They lost Bobby Jackson mid-season. Even with all that, Sacramento won 55 games and entered the playoffs a four seed. But the playoff prelude looked entirely different. Weber wasn't himself. His percentages drooped, his defense disappeared, and his presence stymied the system Adelman had reshaped around Stojakovic and Bibby. Once the face of the Kings, Weber bickered with teammates and got booed at home. Reports even surfaced of Weber wanting a trade. Sacramento rekindled some positive vibes with a first round revenge victory over the Mavericks. In the second round, they scrapped out another seven game series against the Timberwolves. Weber put up an admirable fight against league MVP Kevin Garnett. But KG owned game seven in Minnesota. And in the final seconds, Weber's shot for overtime wiggled free of the rim. Now what? With no more basketball, the Kings had to figure out who they were and what, if anything, must change. Petrie had succeeded before with big, risky swings. Would he try something again? He wasn't going to fire Adelman, the first coach ever to win in Sacramento. And though Weber's return went badly for all involved parties, trading the star wasn't the GM's first or second or any choice. Better to let the big guy regain form. Petrie seemed most inclined to keep the core intact, but it wasn't entirely up to him. Divots left in free agency. As much as he loved Sacramento, the 36-year-old wanted one more big contract, and he found that with the post shack Lakers. Stojakovic was disappointed to see Vlade go, and irritated with Weber's ongoing public remarks. So Pedro requested a trade. Anywhere. No dice. The Maloof brothers, who owned the Kings, dismissed the idea. They and Petrie met with Peja and told him to plan on sticking around, so he did. Observers saw a team in turmoil, but the Kings stayed mostly intact. Their main error of note was letting the expansion Bobcats snatch away Gerald Wallace, who blossomed in Charlotte. But Sacramento made up for that by drafting another late bloomer, Kevin Martin. Nice photo. Other than that, the Kings just snagged big ol' Greg Ostertag to replace Devots and marched ahead, hoping everyone would get along. Things seemed fine. Weber did an increasingly decent impression of his pre-injury self, Pages shook off a rusty start, the Kings won games. But Petrie was not feeling it. He tinkered first by trading Christie for the younger Catino Mobley. Then, in February 2005, he made the big move. No, not Stojakovic, Weber, who insisted the stars had nothing between them and that he didn't want to leave. Petrie called trading his cornerstone one of the most difficult and emotional decisions he'd ever made. This fan wondered if the Kings were self-destructing to start over. This one was happy to dismiss Weber's sore knees and big salary. And finances did indeed seem like the main thing on Petrie's mind. Because even considering Weber's condition and contract, this return was pretty weak, though salary differences did afford Sacramento at least a bit of future flexibility. And good thing for that, because the Sonics booted the Weberless Kings right out of the 2005 playoffs. Yes, Sacramento lost to a braided Vlad Radmanovich. Yet another step back from the accomplishments of 2 Now what? The Maloofs weren't 100% in on Adelman, but had already exercised the option on his contract for one more year. Even after the playoff disappointment, even after a flirtation with Phil Jackson, the Kings kept their coach. So it was on Petrie to improve the roster, which lacked in several areas. 
He watched some of Sacramento's role players depart while searching for moves to replenish talent. In August, the Kings were part of a multi-team deal that lost them Bobby Jackson, but brought in the versatile Bonzi Wells, who had just one year left on his contract. Then, they finally found a hopeful Weber replacement. Sharif Abdur-Rahim, the one-time All-Star who was only available because a knee issue derailed his trade to the Nets earlier that month. So, yeah. Here were your kings entering the 05-06 season. Kinda underwhelming, and as it turned out, not very good. The defense hadn't really improved, and the offense took a dip. Stojakovic and the newcomer Wells both missed a bunch of games due to injuries. By late January, the Kings were well below 500, headed for their first draft lottery since the pre-Adelman 90s. But Petrie, refusing to settle, made a move. The Kings finally granted Page's trade wish, dealing him straight up to the Indiana Pacers in exchange for the man known at the time as Ron Artest. Artest hadn't settled back into a happy role with Indiana after his long suspension for the Malice at the Palace, so the deal made sense for both sides. Artest had a wild card persona, but also elite defensive talent, so the Kings accepted the risk. The Maloofs were gamblers, or, you know, they owned casinos. Anyway, the move paid off immediately. The Kings salvaged their season, playing elite basketball after the All-Star break. Sacramento made the playoffs as an 8 seed and put up a decent fight against the 1 seed Spurs before losing in 6. Now, at this point, you might be saying, Okay, so an elite team met some bad luck, made some moves, and regressed to middle of the pack. Not much of a collapse. Shut up. Here it comes. Not long after the playoff defeat, the Kings fired Coach Adelman. Petrie may have wanted to keep his old friend around, but those spiky-haired brothers who'd courted Phil Jackson then spent the last season screaming from the sidelines were done with the coach. To replace Adelman, the Kings hired Eric Musselman, why addle men when you can muscle men? After some negotiations with Wells, now a free agent, the Kings let him walk and signed John Salmons to a big contract. And here you go, the 2006-2007 Sacramento Kings. Our test played well, Bibian Abdurrahim stayed healthy, Salmons was fine, and Kevin Martin broke out as one of the league's top scorers. And they sucked. Musselman's team played fast like the old Kings, but their offense was much less efficient and their defense dismal. The Kings lost 49 games and missed the playoffs. So they fired Musselman, hired Reggie Theus as coach, picked Spencer Hawes in the lottery, and spent money on big man Mikey Moore. When that team predictably continued to lose, Petrie dealt away the last remaining member of the 0-2 Kings, Mike Bibby, to dip fully into rebuild mode. From 08 to 09, the Kings emptied out, they became the worst team in the NBA. The 09 draft lottery, though, didn't go how they'd hoped. Sacramento, represented by a recently retired Weber, held the best odds but fell to the fourth pick. The Kings thus missed out on Blake Griffin and James Harden. They ended up picking Tyreek Evans, who won Rookie of the Year and played quite well for a while, but also was not Steph Curry, who went seventh. In the ensuing years, Petrie neither strung together great lottery picks nor found the right leader. He picked DeMarcus Cousins in 2010, which was good, but then he chose Jimmer Fredette instead of any of these guys in 2011 and picked Thomas Robinson over these guys in 2012. After employing Adelman for eight straight winning seasons, the Kings had five coaches over the next seven losing seasons. Never again in Petrie's tenure did Sacramento crack even 30 wins. Climbing out of the basement is way harder than diving into it, and constant threats of franchise relocation only deepened the gloom of this era. With new ownership in 2013, the Kings stayed in Sacramento, but Petrie did not. Out went the final relic of that time the Sacramento Kings were really good. It's a distinct period in the team's history. In the first 35 years the Kings played in Sacramento, they enjoyed eight winning seasons. Those seasons happened consecutively, and they coincide precisely with the tenure of coach Rick Adelman. Those Kings became the league's mightiest team with a perfect mix of players, including stars of different ages, a terrific supporting cast, and the right point guard for the moment. This team was a magnificent construction, but misfortune of every kind forced the architect to dismantle his creation. He never retrieved the right parts to rebuild, and as fast as the Sacramento Kings had climbed, they collapsed. 
Thanks a lot for watching Collapse. I know that must have been hard for Kings fans, but here's a Wolves Collapse if you'd rather see someone else go down the tubes. And if you're looking for something else, try one of these.